I have a friend who did not have the best childhood in the world. Now, she came from a very affluent family here in the state of Florida. Her dad built boats. He built boats for drug runners, drug dealers. They would have him build very expensive boats and very fast boats so that they could outrun the police. And then law enforcement would come to him and have him build them boats fast enough to catch the drug runners' boats. And then the drug runners would come and tell him they wanted faster boats. And so the cycle continued, so the family was very affluent, owned a very nice house on the intercoastal waterway. There were, um, however, some struggles that came with life in this house. This girl, friend of ours, had two sisters, younger, more petite than she, that mom enjoyed dressing up and taking around and showing to her friends, but this friend of ours was not as petite, um, more built like a tomboy. Mom didn't much like showing her to her friends. As a matter of fact, on... The day she graduated from high school, her mom told her she wanted her out of the house and made dad kick her out. For some time, she would sleep in her car in the driveway at night, careful to wake up and leave before mama got up the next morning so that mama would not make an issue of it. As a result, this young lady would live and stay wherever she could. Became pregnant a number of times. I still recall her telling me when she had her first abortion, asking the nurse if she would hold her hand, and the nurse laughing at her and refusing to do so. Had more abortions than she could remember. Tried to change her life by joining the military while in boot camp had her first and only asthma attack and was so such put out of the military, was not able to complete boot camp. Uh, ended up becoming a uh, paramedic. But in pursuit of that job, ended up injuring her back, carrying a gurney with a patient on it, and so was put out of that job as well. When we met her, she was married, had two children, and was searching. I had the opportunity to baptize that young lady, and her life was changed. My friends, it doesn't, <clears throat> it doesn't matter what your background is like. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. God will forgive and can help you. And because of that, he doesn't accept excuses. Each one of the Gospels was written by a different writer for a different audience. Matthew wrote his Gospel with the Jews in mind, so he began his account with the lineage of Jesus, showing that he was rightfully the Messiah. In the genealogy of Jesus, I believe we find included three reasons why Jesus and why God will not accept our excuses. Number one, I want you to realize that your situation does not seal your fate. Your situation does not seal your fate. Look there with me, if you will, please. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. An account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezram. Hezram fathered Aram. Aram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. Solomon fathered Rehoboam, Rehoboam fathered Abijah, Abijah fathered Asa, Asa fathered Jehoshaphat, 
Jehoshaphat fathered Joram, Joram fathered Uzziah, Uzziah fathered Jotham, Jotham fathered Ahaz, Ahaz fathered Hezekiah, Hezekiah fathered Manasseh, Manasseh fathered Ammon, Ammon fathered Josiah, Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Sheatil, Sheatil fathered Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel fathered Abiad, Abiad fathered Eliakim, Eliakim fathered Azor, Azor fathered Zadok, Zadok fathered Achim, Achim fathered Eliad, Eliad fathered Elizor, Elizor fathered Mathen, Mathen fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary who gave birth to Jesus who was called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations and from David until the exile to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the exile to Babylon until the Christ, 14 generations. We have here from Joseph's side of the family the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And notice, if you will, a few of the people God had Matthew include in Jesus' genealogy. Verse 6 mentions King David. David was called a man after God's own heart. In spite of his sins, in spite of the fact that he committed adultery with his neighbor's wife and then had that neighbor killed to cover his sin, David loved the Lord. The same verse mentions Solomon, who asked the Lord for wisdom. He built the temple and for the majority of his life served and followed God. Verse 7 mentions Rehoboam. Rehoboam despised God's people and thought only of his own comfort. Verse 7 mentions Abijah. The Bible tells us that Abijah, Rehoboam's son, walked in the sins of his father. Verse 7, we see Asa mentioned. 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 11 tells us that Asa cried to Jehovah his God. Verse 8 mentions Jehoshaphat. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 tells us Jehoshaphat prayed, Our eyes are on thee. Verse 8 mentions Joram. In Joram we read, But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done. Verse 8 mentions Uzziah. And we are told in the Bible of Uzziah, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. In verse 9, we read of Jotham. Jotham was victorious over many opposing armies. In 2 Chronicles chapter 27 and verse 6 tells us, So Jotham became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord his God. In verse 9 mentions Ahaz, Jotham's son, Ahaz. The Bible tells us became king when he was 16. He did not do right in the eyes of the Lord. He made molten images to the Baals. Verse 9 mentions Hezekiah. The son of Ahaz prayed, O Jehovah our God, save thou us. We could continue on and on, and we find the same repetition. A godly king can have a godly son, or a godly king may have an ungodly son. An ungodly king may find his son following in his footsteps, or his son may see the error of his father's ways and choose to follow God instead. My point is your situation does not seal your fate. There are many people today who claim that they act the way they do because of their environment. They act the way they do because their parents acted they, that way. They say, it's not my fault. I was brought up that way. Or if you knew what my home life was like, then you would understand. We live in a society where people try to make excuses for the way they act and the decisions they make. They want to say it's their parents' fault. My parents didn't love me enough, or they pressured me too much, or I was potty trained too soon, or my parents did something. If you only knew the bad breaks I've had, if you only know the way people have treated me and cheated on me, if you've been through what I've been through, then you would act the same way. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, we are told the person whose sins will die. The father will not bear the punishment the son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. My friend, your situation, your background, your environment does not give you an excuse for rejecting Jesus Christ. And it does not give you an excuse for living in sin. 
You cannot blame your laziness in following Jesus on others. You cannot blame the sin in your life on your environment. You cannot blame your bitterness on your spouse. You cannot blame your anger on your boss. You cannot say the devil made me do it. The Bible says that it is your choice what path you will follow, what life you will live, and who will sit on the throne of your life. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6, we are told, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, all of us started in sin. And Jesus Christ has paid the price for every one of our sins. And we have to choose which path we will follow and who will be the Lord in our life. And we accept responsibility for the decisions that we make. You see, my friends, your situation does not justify your lifestyle. And second, I want you to realize that your past does not determine your future. In this genealogy of Jesus, there are four women mentioned. Now, it's unusual enough to find women listed in a Jewish genealogy. But if you were to look for matriarchs listed in ancestors of Jesus, you would expect to find godly women, women like Sarah and Rebecca or Rachel and Leah. But these four women stand out because they are missing. Instead, Matthew lists four other women. He lists Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and her who had been the wife of Uriah. Now what is it about these four women that stand out? In verse 3, we read of Tamar. If you remember, Tamar was Judah's daughter-in-law. Her first two husbands died and she was childless. Now, it was the custom in those days for the widow to be giving to the next son in line so that he could bear children for his dead brother. But Tamar's father-in-law refused to do that. And so Tamar dressed as a prostitute and tricked her father-in-law into sleeping with her and gave birth to his son. So she was guilty of incest. In verse 5, we read of Rahab. If you remember, Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. She hid the Israelite spies, and so they spared her when they destroyed the city. Verse 5, we read of Ruth. The Bible records nothing truthful, truly sinful about Ruth other than the fact that she was a Moabitess. She came from a nation of people who did not believe in the one true God but worshipped idols instead. And in verse 6, we see listed there Bathsheba, except the Bible will not even record her name in this passage. Instead, it refers to her as she who had been the wife of Uriah. That's Bathsheba. Her sin was so terrible that Matthew blushed at the thought of even mentioning her name. Bathsheba is the woman who cheated on her husband with King David. She became pregnant by him, so David had her husband killed. She then married the man who killed her husband. Each of these women were either sexually immoral or they came from a nation of unbelieving people. And yet God chose to use them in spite of their past. Save your places and turn with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 beginning in verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul says, such were some of you. My friend, I don't care what you have in your past. I don't care what mistakes you have made. I don't care what sins you have committed. 
I don't care how long you have run from God or how many people you have hurt. In spite of it all, God loves you. He will forgive you and use you if you ask. God will not accept your excuses because your past does not determine your future. Jesus can and will change your life if you let him. And third, I want you to understand that your God does not change his mind. Look there again, if you will, please. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. An account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse 1 begins by calling Jesus Christ the son of David and the son of Abraham. We've been studying the book of Genesis together. We're very familiar with Abraham. Matthew began his book, referred to this, to Jesus this way for a very special reason. If you remember, God once promised Abraham that through him all nations would be blessed. If you've happened to ride on the hayride in the last two nights, you'll know how the whole world has been blessed through the birth of Jesus Christ and through the lineage of Abraham. Well, the Jews certainly weren't blessing the world at that time. For the most part, they separated themselves from Gentiles. They looked down their noses at them and had very little to do with them. It was not until Jesus Christ came offering salvation to all seeking to save the lost that all nations were blessed through the lineage of Abraham. Likewise, God told David that one of his descendants would sit on the throne forever. It was only a few generations after David's death that his descendants quit ruling. It wasn't until Jesus Christ came, born through the lineage of David, and again ascended to heaven, that one of David's lineage again assumed the throne to rule forever. Many people have given up on the promises of God in the, in the New Testament. Some had given up believing that God had changed his mind and that his promises would never be fulfilled. But my friend, I want you to know that your God does not change his mind. The promises that he made in the days of old still apply today. Lamentations chapter 3 beginning in verse 22, we read the Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. By the way, here's a good place for an amen. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. My friends, God promised to help with temptations. The Bible says there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted beyond that which you are able, but will, the tempta with, will with the temptation provide a means to escape that you may be able to endure it. A while back, the Orlando Sentinel reported on a man by the name of Timothy Pilgrim. Timothy was arrested on two charges of murder and four charges of attempted murder after driving over six outlaw biker gang members on their motorcycles. Later, he blamed his rage on a history of drugs, alcohol, and childhood abuse. He said he had been abandoned at age four, had been in and out of juvenile detention by 14 spent nearly a year in prison for stealing a car when he was 18. My friends, I want you to understand that God will not accept your excuses because God has provided a means to escape. He has provided a way that you can have a relationship with him. He has provided a way so that your life can be changed. God will not accept excuses because as the Bible tells us, in the fullness of time, God sent his son Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, he will do that and can change your life. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and sup with him and he with me. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. My friends, there is no room for excuses in our lives. Because God, at great expense, gave us an opportunity for a new beginning. By sending his son, Jesus Christ, to pay a price so that we would not have to. Our friend could have given up. She could have made excuses saying, my environment was too tough, I can never change. She could have said, I've made too many mistakes, God will never forgive me. Instead, she chose to believe the promises of an unchanging God. The God who still delivers today. The God who still gives victory today. The God who still forgives today. The God who can change your life forever. Tell me, will you quit making excuses today and take God at his word? Will you quit making excuses today and say, I want to make a difference? Here I am, Lord. Use me.